We super ovulated those cows, we harvested the embryos, and we saw some differences there. Hi, I'm Bill Weiss, host of the Dairy Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. My guest today is Dr. Phil Cardoza. He's an associate professor at the University of Illinois. He's been there since 2012. And he does extension and research work in the in looking at the interaction between nutrition and reproduction. Phil, welcome to the to the Black Belt. Thank you, Bill. Glad to be here. It's good good to see you again. Yeah. Uh, today, what we're going to talk about, you guys have done a lot of work on the use of rumen protected methionine in transition cows, and you know that's a, a period of time where protein synthesis isn't real high. So one would question what what was the reason, or why did you come up with the hypothesis to look at methionine at, at this period? Yeah, and, uh, that's a very good point, and uh, the way that I got. Uh, involved with it was that uh, Dr. Juan Lor, he was uh, performing a transition uh, trial looking into um, milk protein, uh, specifically in this time, so that early lactation, can we build up that um, uh, milk protein in early lactation? And then there was an interest in say, okay, what else? How about reproduction? And that's where I started to get interested in is because I remember back in Brazil, doing embryo transfer that how important methionine was for the growth of the embryo. And then we kind of, you know, tag along our lab with that project. And we saw some effects on the reproductive uh, performance, like in the embryo. So we super ovulated those cows, we harvested the embryos, and we saw some differences there. And then since then, we've been doing other trials and where then I'm focusing more on the part of uh, not only repro, but also interested in that muscle mobilization. So I think most recent, we didn't publish yet the, the trials, but it seems that when we do ultrasound in the cow and we kind of try to see that body condition score change, what's muscle and what's back fat, that that amino acid has some impact on keeping some of those muscle reserves from the trans- even in the dry period, what's very interesting, but also in neural lactation. So I think there is something to it where not necessarily focusing on milk protein, but also keeping that, I'll say, metabolically active tissue of the cow that is the muscle uh, more intact. I think that's one of the big things that we've been looking at. And then we see impacts on repro all over. What, um, just to remind everyone, when do you typically start supplementation and when would you end in, in your tip? I know you've done a whole series of experiments, but what's the typical protocol on dose, duration, et cetera? I think that the typical would be the pre-fresh. So let's say three weeks before or four weeks before. And we are trying to follow them at least until 70 days in milk, 60, 70 days. So after you get that cow, let's say, bred and hopefully pregnant that's where we see most of the the people or that's where our work is been but up to the high group i'll say that's where people mostly are formulating for and you you've done studies looking you know you start pre-fresh but then you looked at cat, cat newborn calves and other things what do you find you know that you could that's mostly caused or you think is caused by pre-fresh supplementation. So what do you see very, very early after calving? Yeah, so the very interesting, and that's where I think, you know, we've done work with rumen protected methionine, rumen protected lysine as well. And in both cases, when we feed both of those amino acids, I think two things are interesting there. One thing is that we saw differences where calves, so imagine the cows calve, we take them out from the dams, we give commercial colostrum, and there is a difference there that the calves coming from cows that receive rumen protected lysine and methionine, they had a tendency to consume more of that milk replacer. And there is some indication that when we check for their uh, uh, immune cells, like early on, in, 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 you know, res- that the thymus is, is still present and they are formulating or they are prepping for those immune cells, those seem to be a little bit different. On the other hand as well, we seem like 
Then we followed the placenta of those cows and we saw that there were an effect of the placenta. So we could follow through feeding the cow on those three weeks through the placenta, there are changes. And the changes that we see was very interesting because when we feed the lysine, it seems like the uptake of methionine, at least the receptors, they are more expressed. So that's why I think it's very hard for us to go out there, take a blood sample and see if the cow is well fed or not, because you have all this modulation in the tissues that you feed one amino acid, now the other one is being more utilized. Uh, so it's something that I think we talk a lot about the methionine and lysine, but we always guarantee that they had a bunch of the other amino acids as well. So, you know, that NP preparum, we are pushing 1,200 grams. And I, I think all the trials we've done, they've been to that level, to 1,200 to 1,100. Uh, so I think that's pretty important. I think it's, you know, and I think one of the mechanisms is just that uh, those amino acids are, you know, important for protein synthesis, but I think there's some indication that that mTOR pathway that is like, hey, let's trigger this. Uh, it's in the absence of glucose in that period. I see all those things are kind of triggering the effect of methionine. That's why maybe later on you don't see that much of effect because you don't have that um, uh, insulin resistance per se that is forced by gestation. You don't have that lack of intake after calving. I think, you know, if we could drive intake up, we could solve all the issues, you know, uh, and we wouldn't be worried about perhaps like driving this so nitty gritty of this, you know, amino acids. So, Introducing Ultrasorb R3.0, Volac's comprehensive and complete solution to reduce the negative impact of naturally occurring toxins on ruminants. Ultrasorb R3.0 is a species-specific product designed to mitigate the effects of specific mycotoxins in the gastrointestinal tract of ruminants. Ultrasorb R3.0 also offers lipopolysaccharides binding capabilities. Endotoxins such as LPS can contribute to inflammation in ruminants with energy partitioned to mount an immune response instead of production. Learn more about Ultrasorb R3.0 at volac.com. I think there's no doubt that both energy and proteins negative, just it's probably only three or four days prepartum. And it's mm -hmm. because of, you know, intake tank so much, but requirements stay high. There's, there's a lot, I guess, just to finish up for, there's been a lot of interest on how nutrition affects colostrum, both yield and, and quality. Have you done any look, looking at how methionine would affect that? Yeah, we've done with the lysine trial with methionine. And we, at least in our analysis that we do, you know, protein and solids or even yield, we didn't see any effects there. Um, and I'm not sure if uh, there's something we are missing, you know, we should be looking at something different, but we didn't see anything like that, more fat, more protein, uh, at least for that first secretion, that's what we are targeting. And just to finish up here, in your studies, you said you typically feed pretty high MP diets pre-fresh. So that may be a reason you don't see much with colostrum on amino acids. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Well, this has been interesting, Phil. Thank, thank you for your, for your discussion. No, thank you for having me.